Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us here at the Henry Street Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible class. It's a great honor to have you with us in our fellowship tonight and this class in order to reason together through the scriptures, learn a bit, a little bit more, become closer to Christ, be encouraged. Whatever God has planned in the word is yours for the taking tonight. Uh, of course, just want to continue to remind you that every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central Time, especially if it's the first time you visiting with us tonight, is the designated time for our Wednesday night Bible class virtually here on Facebook Live. So we encourage you to continue on with this uh, fellowship and what you've started as far as uh, continuing your studies. Um, our style of doing Bible studies that we go through a book of the Bible verse by verse from beginning to the end of that uh, Bible. That, uh, that book of the Bible, excuse me. That is. So um, if you want to catch up with us, I'll tell you how you can do that if you're uh, just coming in a little bit later than others. Uh, nonetheless, you're welcome. And of course, we've designed it where we have recorded sessions so you can uh, come into the um, lesson caught up with everyone else on your own time. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Romans part number 12, the tremendous faith of Abraham. Again, that's Romans chapter number 12, the tremendous faith of Abraham. Um, also, want to invite you out to come and worship with us. There's going to be nothing like a Henry Street uh, Church of Christ worship service. And we meet every Sunday at 10 a.m. Central Time for worship at the following address, uh, 309 Henry Street, Gadsden, Alabama, 35901 is our zip code. And you can find us online at www.henrystreetchurchofchrist.com for more information about the congregation, meeting times, and other videos, etc. Um, on there, even events that will be coming up. But also two more resources before we get into our study tonight. Uh, please know we have a YouTube channel and it's our Bible study series. And on YouTube, you can go to www.youtube.com and you can type in my name, Anthony O. Norwood. I'm the minister there that's so blessed to be a servant there at the Henry Street Church of Christ. You'll see my picture, uh, black tie, I'm excuse me, black suit, uh, red tie and my glasses there, that means you come to the right place, especially when you see the banner that um, has Bible study series at the top. And of course, in YouTube style, uh, they're going to put your front page on there and they're going to have the last few videos. Uh, we're always going to have that filled up by the grace of God, meaning that we post videos every day and we do a daily devotional called One Minute Inspirations. And we encourage you to subscribe to this channel on YouTube. Uh, like and uh, share the videos as well, because in doing so, you become an ally with the word of God and you're actually helping spread it across the globe. You know, Jesus told us in Matthew 28, 18 to 20 and Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16 to spread the gospel, the good news of salvation being available in Christ uh, throughout the entire world. This is a very easy way to do it. Just add a push of the button. You can share this uh, Facebook uh, session live or recorded, or you can also uh, like and share the videos uh, on um, YouTube. And of course, by subscribing every time that you come into your YouTube, in other words, that you sign in, uh, you'll get notifications of uh, the latest videos. Again, we post every day. And that'll be including today, uh, Lord willing, after we finish this lesson here on Facebook Live, we'll post it on YouTube as well. And we try to do it in an organized way. Because God is not the author of confusion, we want to make sure everything's in order. We use a system uh, that YouTube has in place called Playlist. And Playlist is just a fancy way of saying um, categories. So we do categorize everything on here. And I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we have 19 categories. Uh, some of them being, again, the One Minute Inspiration, which is an everyday um, uh, daily devotional, if you will, of a Bible study uh, that's very brief. Uh, they're originally called One Minutes because uh, they are originally designed for uh, TikTok. And TikTok at one time had a limit of one minute. Then they went to three minutes. And then they went to ten minutes uh, as of, of today. So you'll see them anywhere from about one to three minutes. And so it's a quick and easy way of 
being inspired by the word of God, letting it guide you, let it comfort you, let it strengthen you, encourage you in the beginning of your day. Because remember, we try to post these every morning so it can be that like a North Star guiding us directly to the path that God wants us on that day. But of course, you got others. Um, we have studied the Gospel of John from beginning to end. So if you want to study that book of the Bible from verse one to the very end of the uh, of the uh, whole book, we have that documented in these videos under the category uh, also called playlist of the gospel of john got more advanced things like creation versus evolution you know for instance you know science will work with the bible as long as you're interpreting science correctly and applying it correctly it will uh, gel with uh, the bible perfectly and i show you that as we go forward in that playlist I uh, got other things like uh, marriage, divorce, and remarriage, um, the second coming, sound doctrine, etc. Sound doctrine is basically the uh, fundamentals of the Bible. Okay, so the foundational teachings of the Bible. So if you're beginning your Christian journey, that'd be a good place to start. Make you pretty strong there as you go forward because you're going to be attacked every day. The moment you became a Christian was the moment you became on Satan's hit list. He's going to try to do everything he can to de destroy your faith and make you go back to where you came from. In other words, to stop the Christian journey. So sound doctrine is a good place to be to get stronger. You'll be able to identify his tricks, his schemes, and be able to conquer them uh, through the word of God. And lastly, uh, one more resource out there is our TikTok channel. Uh, it's under the name. It's all one word, Bible Understanding. And that's where we do put those one minute inspirations. They originate in um, TikTok and also go on YouTube uh, as well. So I encourage you to go out there and, and uh, get your account in TikTok and uh, look for the word Bible understanding. You'll see that symbol there. I, I use it as like a little logo. And that's basically a stopwatch there. Uh, again, going along with the theme one minute inspirations. OK. All right. So let's get into the word of God tonight. Uh, we're going to uh, start with Romans chapter 4, verse 19 to 21. We're picking up where we um, left off. And before getting into that, I'd just like to acknowledge everybody that's on here. I see, I can't call every name, but I do see many members of the uh, Henry Street Church of Christ online. So we have Gaston, Alabama. We have uh, Birmingham, Alabama, and everywhere surrounded uh, that's a part of the Henry Street Church of Christ. I also see Tennessee on the line. I see Michigan on the line. Um, and do we have anyone else from any other place? Please acknowledge where you're from because we like to acknowledge where you're at. And I uh, love to see our brethren that are across the United States where we are, but also in our Canadian brothers, our Mexican brothers, our African brothers, our Caribbean brothers, our Asian brothers, our brothers from the Middle East, Antarctica, wherever you may be. Uh, acknowledge where you're at uh, because we love to uh, see where you're from and be encouraged by you being with us as well, especially from an international standpoint. But let's get into Romans chapter 4, verse 19 to 21. You know the proper way to study the Bible is to study the context. So we're going to read both verses through, uh, all three, excuse me, uh, verses, and then we're going to discuss them in detail. And of course, no study is good unless we can apply it to what we're going through today. So we're going to be doing that as we go forward with the study. Again, for those who's joining us tonight, we're starting Romans uh, part four, uh, excuse me, Romans part 12. And we're going to talk about the tremendous faith of Abraham, how that's an inspiration to us and what we need to imitate. Again, it's Romans part 12, the tremendous faith of Abraham. All right, so let's read it. Now, I'm reading from the King James Version of God's Word. It reads as follows. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Again, that's out of the King James Version. That's Romans chapter 4, verse 19 to 21. All right, let's look at these uh, three verses in more detail. Going even back to verse number 18, within... Romans 4, verse 18 to 21, God continues to testify about the faith of Abraham. Now, Abraham had tremendous faith. And that's one of the reasons why God uses him as an example for all of us to follow. 
Remember, we talked about on last occasion that those who have a true unswerving faith in God's word are considered the seed of Abraham, which, of course, means those today that believe and obey the New Testament, which was given to us by Christ Jesus and put in effect, that is, made the word of God that we all must obey when Christ died on the cross of Calvary. Again, Colossians 2, 14, Hebrews 12, verse 24 teaches us that, that we have to be New Testament people in order to be approved, pleasing to God and to be of God's people. We cannot go by the Old Testament. The Old Testament was for Israel. It was for those of Jewish stock. And so uh, after you know, Christ died on the cross, the New Testament replaced the Old Testament as the word of God that we must live on under today. Remember that concept. This is not a Bible word. It's a scholar word. That concept is called a dispensation. Dispensation means the portion of God's word that you must live under in order to please him at different points in humankind's existence. Remember, for instance, there was a patriarchal dispensation. And that's when God talked to the fathers of every family and gave them the word of God. And so Abraham lived under the patriarchal dispensation. And so at all those after him, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, etc., all of them are part of the patriarchal era. And so they were going under the word of God that was revealed to them, which is the book of Genesis. Okay, uh, the second, uh, I shouldn't say second, but the next is probably a better way of saying it. Dispensation was the Mosaic Dispensation. That's the books of Exodus to um, Deuteronomy. And that's where God had given the law of Moses unto them. And so after Moses came back with first the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter number 20, God continued to reveal the Old Testament law of Moses to man which, of course, God kept expanding upon, kept revealing, in other words, that's how you get Exodus all the way to Deuteronomy being the law of Moses. OK, the patriarchs, excuse me, the prophets, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hezekiah, etc. All those uh, other books of the Bible before the New Testament are still the law of Moses. What I mean by that is that these were people that lived under the law of Moses. They were still under the Mosaic dispensation. OK, so they had to go by the law of Moses. And then we come into the Christian era, the Christian dispensation, when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, which made Matthew to Revelation the word of God that we must live under today in order to be pleasing to God. OK, so I know I, I deviated from the lesson a little bit here, but I want to make sure you understand that time frame. So Romans chapter number four is part of the New Testament, also known as the New Covenant in the Bible, so it is the word for Christians and all mankind to obey and believe to be saved. Okay, all right, so let's go back to Romans chapter 4, verse 18 to 21. So, in this passage of scripture specifically, God continues to testify about the faith of Abraham. Again, Abraham had a tremendous faith, tremendous faith that pleased God. See, when Abraham came along, he had every reason to doubt when you think about it from a human standpoint that he would not have an heir to his name, even though God promised him an heir. Now, I didn't say that Abraham doubted. That's not what I'm saying, because Abraham didn't doubt for one minute that he would have an heir. He would have a descendant that would carry on his name. OK, um, but God promised this in an exceptional fashion that for 99.9% .9 of us in the world today, we probably wouldn't believe God uh, because of the circumstances surrounding this pro promise that he would have a child, he and Sarah being very up in age. How old was he? Well, Abraham was about a century old. In other words, he was about 100 years old and Sarah was about 90 years old when they had their child, Isaac, which was the child of the promise. Now, it, that in and of itself is exceptional when you think about it, because I don't know any in my time on earth. I don't know any in the history books outside of the Bible of anyone, any woman having a child at 90 years old. I don't know of anyone having a child at 100 years old as a man. And so obviously then 
this had to be an extremely miraculous situation going on because it defied nature. And remember, God told Abraham this was going to happen long before it ever happened. Now, let's look at this for today then. Again, this uh, 100-year-old man and 90-year-old man should have been medically impossible to happen. But it did because remember, as Luke chapter 1 verse 37, that God tells us that there's nothing that's impossible unto God. Okay? So he can even make a very aged and a very aged woman have a child outside of what the medical community would ever think was possible, even in today's uh, medicine. So even if Abraham believed that he could have children, he could have easily said that Sarah could not. So in other words, uh, Abraham had every reason not to believe that God was give give him a miraculous child. Okay, because you know, say for instance. He said, Abraham, you can have children even at 100 years old. But, you know, Abraham would look to his right and say, well, you're looking at my wife. Do you realize that this woman would be 90 years old or so when she would have a child? You know, most people would say impossible. That wouldn't happen. But Abraham never said that. Abraham, there's no indication period in the scriptures that Abraham doubted for one second that he and Sarah would have this miraculous child, which we know later on the Bible called him Isaac. Okay. All right. So let's move on. So again, that means that nothing's impossible to God. Do you believe that nothing's impossible to God? If so, write it, write it in your, in your, your comments here as we go along. Nothing's impossible for God. All right, let's continue on. We also know that God cannot lie and he cannot fail. Abraham believed that God could miraculously touch both his and Sarah's body to make his word come to life. In other words, his promise would not fail. This was surely faith that we all must imitate. Faith in the impossible because God can do anything. Okay, let's continue on in Romans chapter 4, verse 12 to verse number 25. If you understand, put in. I understand. All right, so... Romans chapter 4, verse 25 to 20, excuse me, Romans chapter 4, verse 22 to 25 reads as follows, out of the King James Version of the Bible. It says, And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who, had, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Again, that's Romans chapter 4, verse 22 to verse number 25. All right, let's look at these verses in a little bit more detail. Now, remember our author is Paul. And remember the book of Romans is a letter to the church that met in Rome. So the church of Christ that met in Rome. Okay. All right. Which eventually became scripture and added to the canon, which means put in the Bible. Okay as uh, the Holy Word of God, which it was, okay? So Paul was being moved by the Holy Spirit and he revealed Romans chapter 4, verse 22 to 25 to us. Now, he is showing us that without the deeds of the law of Moses, Abraham was credited as being righteous by God. So remember your context. This letter is addressing uh, Jewish Christians and also the Jewish community in the area. So Paul is determined through God's revealing to him to show the superiority of faith in Christ, living under the law of Christ. The Bible actually calls the New Testament the law of Christ instead of the law of Moses that they always had and were afraid or never wanting to let go of. OK, because they had been under the law of Moses for, for hundreds, if not thousands of years at that point. OK. But God was replacing it with faith in Christ, meaning the what? The New Testament. OK, so now remember, in order to talk to a Jewish person, you have to know Jewish history. Remember, Abraham is the father of all Jewish people by blood and they trace everything back to him. And they included, you know, you can look, at, look this up also in New Testament, other parts of the New Testament that since they were a part of Abraham by blood, they were automatically saved. They were automatically under um, God's favor, which that was not the case. 
because blood relations can't save you. And this is and it's, so they're trying to show them, okay, if you tra trace yourself all the way back to Abraham, understand this about Abraham. Abraham was never a man that was under the law of Moses. He wasn't under uh, the the Ten Commandments in uh, Exodus to Deuteronomy. Because why? He lived before the law of Moses. He lived hundreds of years before the law of Moses even was given in the earth. And so they're showing, what he's trying to show them is that there's something greater than the law of Moses. That is faith in God's word as Abraham demonstrated who was born and lived and died before the law of Moses that you Jewish people are trying to hang on to. In other words, if Abraham does not lead, need the law of Moses to have God's favor, you don't either, is what he's saying. Does that make sense to you if you're listening to me here um, out in cyberspace right now in this lesson? Okay, so what God did is God, God revealed this status of Abraham's righteousness based on faith in a word that existed before the law of Moses. And he's talking about Abraham's faith in his word without the law of Moses for the benefit of Christians in Paul's day. And our own. In other words, us as Christians, we don't have any business going back and trying to live the things that were commanded to the Jews uh, from Genesis to Malachi. Okay, we can't do it. As we mentioned earlier, Paul has taught all the way up to this lesson in Romans chapter number four um, that we can't keep it anyway. The Jews never kept it. We can't keep it in holiness. So you don't want to go back and put yourself under the law of Moses because you're setting yourself up for failure. Remember chapter three, we talked about that. Romans 3, 23 and Romans 6, verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death and the gift of God is, uh, and the gift, but the gift of God that is, is, is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And I paraphrase it there. All right. So Paul is making an argument here. Remember. This book of the Bible is an argument in favor of Christ, your Savior, in favor of the New Testament, overruling and replacing the Old Testament. OK. All right. So our righteousness is not taken from us obeying the Old Testament. We can't get it that way because the Old Testament always convicted us of being sinful and evil because we always sin under it. OK, because we can't keep it in perfection. Uh, to the point that God would approve us and give heaven as our home. No person has ever done it. Nobody will, except for Jesus. He's the only one who lived under the Old Testament law in perfection. So our righteousness today, as Paul is teaching in the book of Romans, it comes from faith in God, the Father, what he has taught in the New Testament. That's where we get our righteousness from. Okay. All right. If you understand that, type in, I understand. OK, remember, this is the whole reasoning behind the book of Romans. This, this is the argument Paul is making in order to convert the Jews. And also for those Christians that are Jewish Christians, you know, that, that came from a Jewish background to keep them in the faith. And to also remember the third portion of the book of Romans to show that there is no superiority of those that came from a Jewish background and a non-Jewish background like ourselves in Christ, because you're all in Christ Jesus as one in the New Testament. OK. All right. So remember those goals that are being accomplished by these arguments, if you will, that Paul is presenting from the Holy Word of God. OK. All right. So let's continue on. So, again, this is faith in the work of God, the Father, providing Jesus who was crucified for our sins and raised again. So this leads our faith in the New Testament, which leads to Jesus being the son of God. It all works together. It's all the same thing. This leads us to Christian justification. Remember that word. Don't let it fool you or don't let it deceive you in any way. Or that's not the words I'm trying to use. Don't let it cause a misunderstanding. That's what I mean by that. The word justification means to be declared righteous, to have God's opinion turned from us being sinful in his sight to us being righteous in his sight. That's what justification means, to have God's opinion that we're righteous people because we are Christians, okay? So what Paul is teaching, the whole New Testament teaches, that Christians are righteous because of the death of the one who beat death, 
which is Jesus, because he why he rose from the dead. Okay. All right. Very, very, very short quiz. Probably your 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 shortest pop quiz you'll ever have. It's only one question. And I want to ask this question and I want you to participate. And I want you to be able to answer uh, this two-part question. And please do so by typing in your answer. I'm going to give you a couple, two, three minutes maybe, um, in order to answer this. And this is important of why Abraham is our spiritual ancestor when it comes to faith. Okay? So here's your question. And I want you to be able to answer to the best of your ability. You normally do a good job for those that are faithful to these broadcasts. Uh, I'm, here's a question. Why was Abraham's faith extraordinary? What can we use from his life regarding faith as Christians today? Again, why was Abraham's faith extraordinary? What can we use from his life regarding faith as Christians today? All right, I'll let you go ahead. I'll give you uh, about three minutes here because it's a compound question. So go ahead and type in your answers, please. I know you do well. I have confidence in you. And congratulations as well for completing Romans chapter number four. It's an extraordinary accomplishment, a blessing of God. Again, why was Abraham's faith extraordinary? What can we use from his life regarding faith as Christians today? Any takers? I'll give you about another minute here. All right, Sister Green wrote a very good response. He was literally after God's own heart and his faith is an example that anything is truly possible through God and to be patient. Sister Pamela Norwood, my mother, wrote, because of his faith in God, he worshiped God and he obeyed God. We have to worship and obey God, live a godly life. Okay, very good. Any others? Feel free. Give you a little more time. Sister Norwood also wrote, we must trust God. Very good. My wife, Jocelyn, wrote, Jocelyn Norwood wrote, God made the promise to Abraham when he was 75 years old that he would have a child. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. He continued to have faith in God that he would fulfill his promise. All right, very good. Any others?
All right, one more minute. Just because you've been responding, we'll give more, a couple more people a chance if need be. This is Jackson Norwood also wrote, as Christians, we must continue to have unwavering faith in God. All right, Brother Broderick Lewis wrote, trusting in God is our best interest, even in times of hardships. Absolutely. Abraham definitely had those. All right, let's move on. This question is based on Romans chapter 4, verse number 18, of course, and any subsequent scriptures that actually relate it as well. Let's look at what that scripture says. It's Romans chapter 4, verse 18 says, Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Okay? All right. Again, some of what I'm going to say is going to repeat what you have already said, but that's okay because it's going to basically summarize the answer to that compound question that we had. All right? So Abraham's faith made no sense to the natural man. Again, in, no, in other words, most people on earth would not believe that Abraham would have a child in his old age in order to fulfill the promise of descendants. When you look at and analyze the verses in Genesis that talks about when the promise came and when it was fulfilled, when it was fulfilled, it came when Abraham was 75 years old. To give him a child to fulfill the prophecy of being a father to many nations. And that was in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 to verse number 4. So again, he would have a child. And this was revealed to him when he was 75 years old. So he was already very up in age. Sarah was already past the years of bearing children. We know that she was uh, 10 years behind uh, Abraham. So she was already 65 years old when this promise came to that uh, holy couple. So you have a woman 65 and a man 75 years old because they were 10 years apart. Okay. So she obviously was already past the years of bearing children. So the promise of God would be impossible naturally for her and probably even Abraham. Uh, thus Abraham believed in the supernatural power of God to make it happen. This is faith against all odds. Even more, the promise was not fulfilled for 25 years. So when you look at that, Promise made, Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 to verse number 4, is 25 years before the fulfillment in Genesis chapter 17, verse 15 to 17. However, Abraham kept believing and God gave them Isaac as promised in Genesis chapter 21, verse 1 to verse number 3. So obviously then, this is tremendous faith. They were already up in age. They were uh, more than likely, from a natural standpoint, not able to have any more children. Uh, and then they had to wait 25 years for that to happen. So they had to be some tremendous people of faith to wait 25 years against all odds for God's promise to uh, come to light, to actually be realized. So we have to really commend Abraham and Sarah. And that's one reason why I believe God has them in Hebrews chapter number 11, which we nicknamed the Hall of Fame of Faith, because they have some serious faith. Uh, beyond what we normally study about them. All right. So if you enjoyed and understood uh, Romans chapter number four, put in, I, I enjoy it. And we're going to move on to chapter number five. And as always, again, we want to properly study the Bible. So we're going to talk about the overall outline of the chapter. Then we're going to study the verses uh, in detail shortly thereafter. All right, so our chapter five outline is as follows. Uh, section one, 
Paul tells the Christian community that we're justified by faith, leading to our reception of God's grace because of Jesus Christ. That's verse number one. Section number two. He tells us that we are joyful because we have the hope of the glory of God, which means eternal life in the heavenly kingdom. That's verse number two. Section three of the outline for chapter number five is Christians are also joyful when hardships come because they build solid Christian behavior. That's verses three to five in Romans chapter number five. Section four is three verses. And it is Jesus died for us when we as human beings were still in a sinful state and as an expression of God's love for us. That's Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to verse number 8. Uh, section 5 is one verse. Christians are declared righteous because of the death of Jesus. That's Romans chapter 5, verse number 9. Section 6 is also one verse. And it is Jesus' death brought peace with God the Father and all the faithful as well. His resurrection guarantees that all Christians will have eternal life. That's Romans chapter 5, verse 10. The uh, seventh uh, division of the outline is nine verses. And it details Jesus' death brings complete atonement. In other words, peace through his sacrifice for all mankind. That's Romans chapter 5, verse 11 to verse number 19. Division 8. God used the law of Moses to show how sinful man had become, but God's grace overspread the effects of sin in mankind. That's Romans 5, verse 20. Uh, next verse, section 9. Sin brought in spiritual death, but grace brought in eternal life through Jesus Christ. Again, that's Romans 5, verse 21. All right, so let's go through. Now that you have the outline, if you're, you're type to take notes, go ahead, go ahead and um, read, look at this video and pause it. You can write down that as well or, or type it in, whatever you want to do in your own uh, word process, whatever the case may be. But let's go to Romans chapter 5. Uh, one of the uh, most profound and enjoyable chapters of the Bible for me from a personal standpoint. <laughs> Tells me how grateful and, and, and fortunate I am to be a Christian. You'll see exactly what I mean by that as well. And I believe you'll come to that same conclusion. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and verse number 2 reads out of the King James Version. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Okay, let's look at these in more detail now. Remember, Always keep in mind the word therefore. Okay, anytime you see therefore, that means basically what you have studied before this verse is bringing you to this conclusion. It's like almost like a summary type statement. Okay, so therefore, in order to understand what Romans 5 is talking about, you got to understand Romans 4. Okay, and so we just went through that and I'm glad you did. Because now, Romans 5 builds on the teachings of Romans chapter number 4. Remember this, and it's no knock against the Bible by any form or fashion. Uh, the original Bible didn't have chapters and verses. Man put those in so we can be organized so that we can get to certain parts of the scriptures directly. So when, you, when Paul originally wrote this, this is just one big document. Okay. So there wasn't a Romans 4 and Romans chapter number 5. It was just all Paul's word just written down. Okay, And man organized that when he put that into the Bible, the chapters and the verses. Okay, So that's why you have a therefore here. It's basically a continuation of the teachings of Romans chapter 4. Okay, All right. So again, let me read it again because I know we got a little bit off track here. I want to explain that to you so you understood that. And you understand that as you go forward in your, your, your own studies to know everything before the therefore. Otherwise, you won't understand this chapter. OK, so again, it says in Romans 5, verse 1 and verse number 2, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. OK, again, the word therefore is key to understanding what the Apostle Paul is saying in Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and verse number 2. He is building on the argument from Romans chapter 4 that Abraham was justified by faith outside of the law of Moses. He is telling the Jewish audience that he is speaking to that God will also justify them 
by faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. In other words, you'll be right um, if you come to faith in Jesus. Okay, that's what basically what that means. And he is showing the audience and all people today that peace with God only comes through faith in Jesus Christ, not the law of Moses. Romans chapter 5, verse 9, and verse number 10, which we'll come to in a moment. Now, without this faith in Jesus, no man can have peace with God. And by extension, this means that no man can have salvation without Jesus being ahead of their lives. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There's salvation with, there is salvation in no other person but Jesus Christ, okay? God's grace, which means his unmerited favor shined upon all of us mankind, is only accessible through faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, we don't have grace at all if we're not Christians, okay? Then we don't have God's favor. And remember, unmerited means we didn't earn it. Christ earned it for us by his complete obedience, life in, G in, 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 in the human flesh, and dying on the cross of Calvary. Okay, him being a sinless sacrifice is a better way of saying it is what earned our salvation, okay? We're basically hanging on his coattails, we like to say, in order to get into heaven, because we can't get in there by ourselves. Only by grace, again, the unmerited, meaning unearned favor, shined upon a mankind is only accessible through faith in Jesus Christ. All right, so God will not give his favor unto any man outside of Christianity. The world don't want to hear that, but that's the truth. Because again, what did Acts 4 verse 12, 12 tell us that? There's salvation in Jesus and Jesus by himself. OK, no others. OK, so this fact makes the Christian community rejoice as they will be glorified by God at the judgment day. This means they will have a home in heaven and eternal life. According to John 3, verse 16, John 14, 1 and verse 2 and verse number 6, among other passages of Scripture. So do you feel fortunate right now that you are in Christ? You are a Christian because you're the only one going to be saved on this planet. OK. Because you're the only one that will have grace because of what Christ earned for you in his 100% uh, obedient life to Christ, uh, I mean to God the Father, and down on the cross of Calvary for you. All right, let's go on to Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to verse number 5. And it reads, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Again, that's Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to verse number 5. We're starting to get into one of the comments made by Brother Broderick Lewis about the tribulations and the hard times here. This is what this is talking about here. You're going to see that uh, in a moment. Let's go back and look at it in detail now. Let's start zooming in um, and looking at these things very closely. Verse number three again says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. So Paul is teaching a valuable lesson to us in Romans chapter five, verse three, and verse number five. He's telling us that we rejoice even when times are hard for us. The result of the suffering is that it makes us stronger Christians. Okay. In other words, it builds an endurance within us. To remain in the faith. Romans chapter 5 verse number 3. Think about this one. I've used this example for you before. Um, but you can't tell it today. Because I'm so overweight. Compared to what I used to be. Um, my mother probably can testify to the fact that. When I was a young man. Maybe about 20 years ago. I was pretty muscle bound. You know I lifted weights for about uh, 4 years. Straight. You know faithfully doing that. And continuing to. Uh, increase the weights and things of that nature. See, the, the theory behind uh, weightlifting is this. The more weight you do, the more repetitions you do, the more you tear your muscles up. Actually, you're, you're, you're temporarily destroying your body when you actually build yourself up lifting weights. And your body responds by repairing your muscles. And when it repairs your muscles after you tear it up from exercising, they become bigger. And when they become bigger, that gives them more capacity in order to take more weight. OK, and that's basically what God is saying uh, when it comes to uh, why we go through hard times, why we go tribulation, why we go through suffering, because what it does, it, 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 it strengthens our faith. It makes us more committed. These, these situations, you know, symbolically speaking, they are tearing us up inside. 
But at the same time, this tearing up is rebuilding us to be stronger so that when things that are harder come, we don't fall apart. We can take them. We can still say God is good. We can still say I'm committed to Christ. Even though I'm suffering, I'm not going to waver from my loyalty to God. It's because we think about it this way. This is the way the human mind thinks. The more I've been through, the more I can take. Huh? The more I've been through, the more I've seen God work in my lives, in my life. And so even when I'm going through my next trial, my next tribulation, my next period of suffering, I'm strong enough to take it because God has already brought me this far. If, if he brought me this far, he'll never leave me. See, that's what your suffering does to you. It makes you stronger in your faith and your loyalty. I know from a human standpoint, we don't want to go through it. Well, it's just like weightlifting. You know, there are many days where your body just does not want to cooperate with you when you're lifting weights. There are days where you're just so tired. You don't, you just, just don't feel like doing it, but you continue to do it because why? You have a goal to reach. You're trying to reach this certain weight level. You're trying to re reach this boldness or you're trying to reach this type of tone in your muscles. So you do it anyway, even though you don't feel like it, even though you don't want it. You know, it's part of it because the moment that you stop, stop, Working out is when your body starts changing again and going back to fat, you know, going back to being overweight. So you stay consistent in order to be strong. OK, now, if that analogy makes sense, if you understand why you go through trials and tribulations, type in. I understand because God is showing you why he allows certain things to happen to us to make us stronger. OK, I also like looking at it this way. It's similar to training for a track meet. That was my other sport I did. I played, I, I did three things uh, in my younger years. I lifted weights, I um, ran track, and I played basketball. But and that's why I understand these things from experience of how they symbolically uh, can represent the Christian life. You see, it's similar to training for a track meet. You must practice every day leading up to the track meet. So that you have the best performance you can at the event that was coming. So remember, in track, you're always preparing for the big event. Okay? The big event is not every day. Okay? Uh, practice is every day, but the big event may be a week later. You're preparing for that event. Okay? So you must practice. You must lift weights. And you must mentally prepare every day until the track meet comes. That process literally hurts the body. And it tests the mind when you're running track. However, at the end of these practice exercises, one becomes a better runner and has a better performance when it counts the most, okay? Because you're consistent and you trained and you went through the pains of practice because practice hurts. And so obviously then it makes you a winner at the end because you're able to get that, that, that strength, that endurance, and that mental edge for when that track meet comes, that big event comes, you're going to make it. And the track meet that I'm talking about is nothing about a trial, but a trial, tribulation, a suffering moment. You prepare for it. You're ready to conquer it now because you prepare for it all the way up to that point. OK, that's different aspects of suffering you've gone through. Every step is suffering in track. It hurts, but it gets you to the point where you're a winner when all is said and done. OK. All right. Going on to verse number four. And we're running out of time here, so I want to make up a little bit, bit of ground here and keep going forward. Uh, the Bible says in Romans 5, verse number 4, and patience experience, and experience hope. Now, moving on to Romans chapter 5, verse number 4, we see that patience, in other words, endurance, brings about experience. Now, the word experience comes from the Greek word dokime. It means tried character. It means strong Christian morals, okay? And so, obviously, then... When you're going through trying times, it not only makes your faith stronger, but it makes you a, a better person from a moral standpoint. In other words, you have better ethics as well. OK, you do the right thing more often because you got the pressure to do the right thing. OK, and when you come through those things, you become stronger. So in other words, our sufferings not only make us stronger in our faith and our endurance, but it also makes us stronger in our moral character. It builds character within us as well. OK, furthermore, the Christian life produces hope. OK, uh, hope is an expectation of eternal salvation. Remember, uh, as we, we talk about a lot in our classes, hope doesn't mean something might happen. Hope means something will happen. OK, it's an expectation 
of eternal salvation. Okay. Thus, if we are faithful Christians until we die, then eternal life will be ours as promised by Jesus himself without a doubt. Revelation chapter two, verse number 10. All right, let's go on to verse number five. We get closer to closing it down here. Uh, verse number five says, out of King James Version, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So regarding Romans chapter five, verse number five, I like the, uh, what well, the King James Version again says, hope maketh not ashamed. Uh, a more contemporary version, New King James Version, makes it clear what God is trying to say and reads. Uh, one way of getting to the truth when you don't understand the King James Version, go to New King James Version. Uh, New King James Version basically eliminates the these and thous and that kind of stuff and puts in more contemporary English uh, words while still trying to uh, maintain the original King James Version. Okay, so here's uh, what it says, and it does it truthfully. New King James Version says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, our hope of eternal life will never disappoint us is what we're being taught here. Because God cannot lie and he cannot fail. He saves us utterly and completely. Okay. One will see this on the judgment day and rejoice. Furthermore, the reception that is the giving of the Holy Ghost to us into the hearts of all of us that are Christian occurs after we repent, meaning that we abandon our sins and are baptized according to Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Remember Acts 2 verse 38 tells us what? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, also known as the Holy Spirit. He is. And he is the token of our salvation. In other words, he's the sign of our salvation, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. And we know that the Holy Spirit dwells within us by the character that it is produced. In other words, he makes us better people. And you can study those. We've studied it several times, but the Holy Spirit... Uh, produces what we call the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, verse 22, verse 23. Some of those characteristics are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, uh, etc. Okay? Uh, so the Holy Spirit is always working on us through the Word of God, obviously, to make us better people and more and more like Christ, the more and more that we live throughout our time on here on earth. Okay? All right. Let's go to verse 6 and verse 7. Verse 7. Romans chapter five or six, verse number seven says, for when we were, it says, so let me get it out here. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Again, that's Romans five or six, verse number seven. Again, verse six says, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now here God is showing us that mankind never had the spiritual strength to remain righteous on its own after the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Paul makes this clear again as we talked about in Romans 3 verse 23 and Romans 6 verse 23 that we all have sinned, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory, meaning the perfection of God. Thus without Jesus, no man has the strength to be righteous on his own merit or her own merit. Supernatural help is always needed for us to do the right thing. See, this is another reason why Paul told us that we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us, Philippians 4.13. Nonetheless, the immediate context of Romans chapter 5, verse 6 is that Jesus was sent to die on the cross of Calvary as the peacemaking sacrifice with God for all mankind. Romans 5, verse 9, verse number 10. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 2. See, all mankind was and is ungodly. That is why the sacrifice of Jesus was made. He was given for the ungodly to be made righteous in the sight of God. And catch, catch those words. We were made righteous. Not that we were. We were made righteous. God changed our stats after Christ died for us and we obeyed him as well. Okay. Verse number seven. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. So moving on to Romans chapter 5, verse number 7, we see the love of Jesus compared to the love of even the best human beings on the planet. We will rarely find someone who would offer their lives in exchange for the life of a righteous person. Some would not even venture to dare to die for us, even if the other person is a righteous man. That's what Paul is really pretty much teaching us here. This is showing us that Jesus died for the ungodly, an unnatural act 
according to how mankind thinks. This is love beyond compare. It is amazing love for mankind who are the ungodly that Jesus died for. He should be loved, praised, and adored for his big heart of compassion for those who are so undeserving. And I'm talking about ourselves here today. All right, we're going to go ahead and stop here. Thank you tonight for being a part of the lesson. If you picked up anything here today, put in uh, in some type of acknowledgement here. Type it in that I learned something today uh, so that your time has been valuable and not wasted as well. And of course, hopefully this is bringing us closer to our God who's molding us and shaping us to be more and more like Christ Jesus. Uh, again, uh, don't forget, uh, we will post this uh, tonight or early tomorrow on YouTube. And again, subscribe, like, and share uh, these videos to help spread the word of God. And it'll be under the playlist on YouTube um, uh, called Romans, obviously, there as well. And, of course, again, you can uh, come to TikTok as well with your own TikTok account. Look up Bible Understanding, and you'll get those one-minute inspirations as well. In other words, those uh, daily devotionals that will help us stay focused on God throughout our day. Try to post those uh, in uh, the morning time to guide us, including myself as well. But also don't forget, um, we meet here every uh, Wednesday at 7 p.m. Central Time. So we will be honored to have you again as our guest. But most of all, we would love to have you in person. Uh, we're in the Northeast Alabama um, area in the United States. We meet again at 309 Henry Street. City of Gadsden, Alabama, 35901 is our zip code. And you can find us easily at www.henrystreetchurchofchrist.com. The plan of salvation, please never forget it. Um, whether you write it down, whether you have that photographic memory, whatever you may do, remember God's plan of salvation so you're ready to share it with other people. And that is based on beginning at Romans 10, verse 17. The Bible says, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Second part of the plan of salvation. The six steps I like to call it. Uh, before you're saved. Uh, is that you must believe in Jesus Christ as the son of God. Which when you're acknowledging that. Is that you also believe that he has authority. That he is Lord and Christ. And that he can deliver. That's what uh, deliver uh, Christ actually means. Uh, and you see that in John 3 verse number 16. About the faith we must have in Christ in Jesus in order to be saved. The Bible says in John 3, verse number 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The third part of the plan of salvation is called repentance. That is the commitment to live the Christian lifestyle. You're committed to live righteous according to Jesus' leadership in the New Testament and leaving a sinful lifestyle alone. You see that in Luke 13, verse 3, and verse 5. The fourth step in the plan of salvation is confession. Romans 10, verse 9, and verse number 10, which we'll study later on, tells us that with the mouth we must confess Jesus as Lord, meaning the Son of God, to be saved. And the fifth step in the plan of salvation is baptism. Baptism is uh, when you are becoming a true follower of somebody. It's called a disciple. And that's when God will forgive you of your sins. Acts chapter 22, verse number 16. Uh, he'll add you to the body of Christ. In other words, put you in the family of God. Galatians 3, verse 27. And he'll save you according to the words of Jesus in Mark 16, verse number 16, is where he said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. And of course, at that point, you are a Christian. You're forgiven. You're saved. But we also have the commitment of the sixth step that we all have to keep. It's in Romans 2, verse number 10, where Jesus said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. In other words, you have to stay loyal, stay reliable, continue to trust in Jesus in your faith and Believe him uh, and obey him to the end and heaven will be your home. So quickly, the quick acronym in order to understand and remember the plan of salvation is HBRCB and add F to that. That is hear the word of God, believe it concerning Jesus Christ, the son of God, uh, repent of your sins, confess Jesus as the son of God, be baptized for forgiveness of your sins, the salvation of your soul, and stay faithful to Jesus unto death and heaven will be uh, your home. If your Christian has done something wrong, that you know that you need to restore your relationship with God. You do that through the grace and mercy offered in Acts 8, verse 22, and 1 John 1, 7, and verse number 10, where God has said that if you repent and confess your fault to him and ask him to forgive you in prayer, he'll definitely do that. Love you all. We'll go ahead and sign out right now, right on time. 
Uh, we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday and Sunday morning. God bless you. Uh, may God keep you and be causing you to have all that you need. God bless you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.